Welcome, friends. We come to the end of our two days event here in London. Did you enjoy the lunch? Yes. How many of you enjoyed the lunch? <laughs> How many of you didn't like it? <laughs> How many of you thought it was too much? <laughs> How many of you think there should have been only one dal, one sabji, and no more, and they served too much? Why am I asking these questions? Because some of the food was taken for my wife and me to eat. And she raised this issue with me. Why are they making so much food? Have they not received the new rule that in a satsang, you should have very simple food so people have not their attention on food but on the spiritual matters and there should be one dal, one sabzi. I couldn't get the answer, but I thought of the answer when I was going back. <laughs> so I made up a nice answer. And when I went back, I said, I asked this question from my friends. There's a group of few people standing along with the organizers, like Shamshir and others. And I said, why are you making so much food? In a satsang, don't you think that uh, there should be only one dal and one sabji? And one of the guys there gave me an answer. He said, this is not a satsang. You're not a master. This is, you are a... F <laughs> you are a friend. And this is a part of your friends. <laughs> she couldn't answer me. <laughs> I just want to share these simple things that happen in life. There are people who are married in households where they are on a spiritual path, nobody else is. There are wives complaining to me, their husbands say, if you follow that cult, you'll be thrown out. And they still want to follow. They don't know which place to meditate in, best place, bathroom in the morning, <laughs> so nobody can see. There was a friend of mine, his name was Seva Singh. He's passed away so I can tell his story. We were class fellows. I might have mentioned his name earlier, that I came to Harvard University on a fellowship. He came to University of Madison, Wisconsin. And his lifestyle was very different. It changed. We used to meet and he began to wonder how I could live in the United States, vegetarian, doing meditation, not going anywhere. So, he, when he went back, eventually, he said, I want to get initiated. So, I took him to the then master, the Dera. I said, this is the Dera. I got initiated here. You take your chance. He got initiated. He didn't tell his wife. Because the, his father-in-law was a very, very important person at that time registrar of a university and later on vice chancellor of the university. So he was afraid to tell his wife, she might tell the father, it will be very bad. So he would co cover his head in the morning. She said, you used to do Kirtan and Gurbani and every day part puja, what has happened to you? Why do you put your sheet on your head and cover yourself every morning now at three o'clock? He said, no, no, I'm doing it in a different way. But she had a big suspicion. Eventually, he came to me. I am now totally bothered how to explain. If I tell her what has happened, she might kick me out of the house. If she doesn't, her father will. <laughs> how do I handle this? I said, you can go back to your master and ask him some advice. Because any, any problems you have, best friend of yours is your master who has initiated you. Go to your master and ask. So he said, you have to come with me. I am afraid to ask. I said, it doesn't matter, we'll ask. We went together, master advised him. One day you will find out, why don't you tell her yourself? He shook like this. He said, I have to tell, no master said so. But you come, and when I tell, 
either I'll be behind you or you tell and I'll be behind you. <laughs> this is really, it's a true story. <laughs> we came back to Chandigarh, that's where we were posted. And I went to her, to their house. And the wife, we used to call her baby or for, for short family friend. And uh, he was behind me, that if any brick falls, not a brick, uh, just one of the big spoons or maybe a dish. So he was hiding behind me. So I said, baby, I want to tell you something. Your husband, my dear friend, got initiated from a master. And he, he was waiting for what happens. <laughs> so was I actually. <laughs> and that wife said, I thought you are my friend. I said, I am your friend. Then how come you only took him for initiation and not me? <laughs> Big shock. She got initiated and told her father. I was working in the government secretariat and he was at that time vice chancellor of the university in the same, in, in the town of Patiala. I was in Chandigarh. He came one day barging into my office and he said, and they tried, people tried to stop him. No, it's very important. I have to meet him right now. And he barged into the office. I saw him. I said, welcome, Mr. Vice Chancellor. What can I do for you? How dare you corrupt my daughter and my son-in-law? I said, you know, I'm not a good influence on people. <laughs> Maybe you didn't know earlier. Don't spend too much time with me, lest you be corrupted. He said, no time for jokes. <laughs> he said, I said, what have I done to them? They have learned how to follow the teachings of the gurus. They have learned how to follow what the five major gurus from first Padshai to the fifth taught. They learned how to practice, not read. I said, have you read the five Banis which are all comprised in Guru Granth Sahib, your holy scripture? He said, yes, I have. I have done a khant part. I have done endless reading. He said, did you read or somebody else read? No, no, I have to hire people to read, of course. You can't read endlessly. I have also attended that endless reading of the scripture. And I have watched them. I watched them reading. And when one is finishing, you can't keep on reading forever. It's a big book, 1200 pages. So when one ends one, then another one sits replacing him to carry on the same words, so it become endless. Because they believe it is unhadbani. It's endless because it must be read continuously. Those belief systems but not a practice. So he mentioned all that, and I at that time had recently read the whole growth very carefully. So I was able to quote from so many verses. I said, it's all a description of human gurus. All 10 gurus had human gurus. Not one of them has ever said a book can be guru. It occurs at least 20 times in the Granth that book cannot be a guru. How can you accept that? Have you read it? First read. And he could quote from those pages. He said, you are confusing me now. Come to my house for lunch in Patiala. I said, certainly. So I had a good lunch with him. At that time, his son was also there. Two sons. And this daughter was very happy. And when I explained again at the lunchtime that it's a matter of practicing what you read, they said, but the Granth says after the tenth guru, there will be no more gurus and the book will be guru. 
I said, I will accept this instantly if you can show it to me. It's nowhere in the Granth Sahib. People are still believing that the scripture says that the book will be Guru. So I have to study a history. How did this phrase come? It's not in the Guru Granth Sahib. And no Guru has said it. None of the ten Gurus ever said it. So how has this phrase come up that's confusing millions of people, not thousands? And then I studied the history that it was in one of the Ardas's prayers that was being done much later, after Guru Gobind Singh had passed away, that one of the, whose name is there in the history if you study, who added the phrase in the Ardas, and that phrase was added, that this is the hukam of a Kalpur, that the Panth will go on, now you should believe, Guru Manio Granth. It's one man adding something much later and the whole community doesn't know about it. I have to study it to be able to tell him. He was shocked. Let me cut this long story short. He became one of the best initiates of the same master. And the master was running the Dera at that time, where I got initiated. And the master made him chairman of the trust to run the Dera. Same man. So these things happen. But I am only saying that we have to face situations where the family members don't follow, friends don't follow. They ask me, I am a Christian, I go to church regularly, I am Catholic. If I get initiated, if I follow this path, you have to leave the church. Of course not. Go to church every day, go every, every Sunday, go whenever you want. We are not contradicting your religious belief. In fact, we are confirming that your religious belief can be practiced and get the results. Similarly, the Hindus, the Sikhs, and the, even the Jews ask me, they should follow. Sure, I have given talks in churches, given talks in temples, given talks in Gurdwara. In Thailand, they recorded my talk, given in a Gurdwara, now based on the scriptures. I given church in a synagogue. The teachings come from their scriptures. And if you study carefully, they're all talking of the truth being inside. Nobody has said truth is outside. Nobody. Truth is inside. Explore it. The teaching has not made a religion. Religions have been made by these people who did not go inside, were outside, and made rituals and ceremonies outside, and they are defining the religion today. Muslims believe in one Allah, not an Allah for Muslims. That's not what the Quran says. Quran doesn't des describe Rabb, Rabbe Muslimin. What does what are the word Rabbe Alamin? God for the whole world. All the founders of religions have said that the Creator is for all people, not a particular community. But every year, Sunnis are killing Shias in the name of the same Prophet, in the name of the same Allah. Why? They have a, they have a difference of opinion after what happened after the Prophet died. Whether the Khalifas were to follow the thing, or Ali, the son-in-law, was to follow, just a little dispute, and they kill each other, kill the real mosques in which the Allah can be found, and they destroy that every year. But what can the mind do? Can you imagine? Christians, in America, I asked, what, what do you think is a Bible? Bible is word of God. I said, do you know who prepared the last edition of it? King James of England. That's the version you are reading there. And it was altered 16 times before that. In the seventh ecumenical council, whole gospel were thrown out. New gospel put in the same book we call the Holy Bible. Study the history of these, how people have messed up and destroyed the message of these founders of religions who were spirit, spiritual 
enlightened people and gave the same message. Go within, the truth is inside. Names don't matter. So I am mentioning this, that if you find a problem that family members, others don't follow, don't stop them. If you stop them and say, I am going to be now following a Santhamath path, path of the saints, and I'm going to leave the religion, then you are making the path of the saints into another religion. If somebody says, I used to go for Mass every Sunday to church, and now I don't go there, I go to a satsang every Sunday, he is making the satsang into a similar church. It has not any benefit. Therefore, these are outside rituals, all of them. If you have to keep peace in the house, you have to follow the rituals for the sake of your family, do it. I give you a practical tip, don't create a problem for yourself that you don't even have peace of mind to your own meditation. So follow these rituals that are required to maintain family peace, to maintain your own ability to meditate better. So that is, there are many stories I can keep on sharing with you of people, how they, how they changed. And I have had very interesting experiences, thanks to Great Master that I, he put me through those, so I could understand what people are facing. So this was just a, a tip to you for, uh, for a dealing with family members who may not believe or being in a situation where friends don't agree. Many people say, this is a cult. They come to me and argue with me. Are you following a cult? I said, what is the definition of a cult? Definition of a cult is, you are afraid to leave it. They frighten you. Now you are here, can't go anywhere else. If you go, we might even kill you. Here, you're free to leave. Here, it's open for everybody. It's not confined to anybody. True spirituality is not for any group, not for any society, not for any religion. It's for everybody. True spirituality is for everybody, whoever is a seeker anywhere in the world. Therefore, it's not a cult at all. It is so open. When I got initiated by this great master, Zul Maharaj Baba Sawan Singh, the opening sentences when he initiated me, I can't forget. His words were, I am giving you what I got from my master, Baba Jamal Singh. It worked for me. I hope it will work for you. If it does not, you are free to choose anything else. You are always free to choose anything better than this. And then he said, added, do me one favor. If you find something better than what I am giving you, please come and tell me so I can also take it. The great master's words. So open. He is willing to take anything if you find something better. I took him very seriously. I still take him very seriously, what he said. So I searched, even after initiation, searched for something better. Searched for several years. That is why I was able to do all those yogas and different types of searches. I searched everywhere. Not only could I not find something better in actual practice, I could not even find them describing properly what you can expect. And that is why I came back to him. And I said, I searched according to your instructions. I couldn't find anything better, otherwise I would have brought it to you. And I'll now very seriously practice whatever you said. He laughed. And he said, try hard. And that's a big joke. But I had to l listen to that and follow it and try it very hard and failed. And then I discovered there is something else in this path. Keep more of the company of the Master. Feel what you feel when you are around. Feel what happens to you somewhere inside, not, not in your thoughts, not in your body. Something inside in your soul. See what happens to you. And that is the development of your spiritual being. It does not mean that you will judge your spiritual growth by what is being seen by you in meditation. 
Many people feel like that. We meditate, but we don't see, so we are not making any progress. Let me tell you a true story of great master's master, Baba Jamal Singh, narrated to us by great master. Baba Jamal Singh, when he was only a seeker, only a disciple of his master, Swamiji from Agra, Swami Seth Sivdiyal Singh, he felt he was missing his darshan. He wanted to go and see him. There were no telephones, no emails, nothing to contact him. Just you could write a letter, just carried very slow. He wrote a letter to his master. I'm talking of masters, my master's master, Baba Jamal Singh. He wrote a letter to Swamiji, beloved master, I miss you so much. I think of you all the time. Will you please give me your darshan? Let me come to you and have your darshan. Tell me when can I come? And then he waited for a reply. After almost a month, a reply came from Swamiji. He said, my beloved son, Jamal Singh, I'm very happy to receive your letter and to know that your soul is roaming around in the higher regions. He said, my soul is going nowhere. This must be a mistake. The master has put somebody else's letter into my envelope. So he wrote again. He said, beloved master, I received your letter. My soul goes nowhere. I only miss you. I just want to come and see you. And I don't know why you have written this thing. must be meant for somebody else. He waited another month. Reply came, second time, to his second letter. My beloved son, Jamal Singh, I'm very happy to know, I've received your second letter, I'm very happy to know that your soul is roaming around in the higher regions. As far as coming to see me is concerned, you can come on the next month, first Sunday. Armed with these two letters, he goes to Agra, to Swamiji, and goes and puts his head on his feet, says, Master, you sent me these two letters. There's nothing, I, they don't apply to me at all. I, my soul was going nowhere. I was just missing you so much that I wanted to come and have your darshan. Swamiji laughed, and there were 10, 12 people sitting around him. And Swamiji said, let us meditate. Come inside with me. So Baba Jamal Singh and Swamiji went inside their hut. Other people waited outside, maybe 15, 20 minutes, half an hour. They were inside the hut and they came back. Then Swamiji asked him, Jamal Singh, is it correct that when I wrote to you that your soul is roaming around in higher regions, it was roaming around in higher regions? Yes, Master. Is it correct? The soul was roaming around in the higher regions when I wrote the letter, not when you were meditating today. Yes, Master. Nobody could understand this conversation. So then he addressed those ten people sitting around. He said, our life in a physical body is determined by a problem, by a destiny, which puts a lot of obligations on us. We have to take care of our job, take care of families, take care of friends, take care of so many things, which requires your attention outside. If everything that is happening in your progress in spirituality became a visual experience for you, it will hinder in your ability to put enough attention in the obligations created by your own karma. It does not mean that the growth in your spiritual elevation is going to be stopped for that. Only blinders can be put on you. So you don't see anything. Blinders are there. Then what is the way to find out that we are making any spiritual progress? The way Baba Jamal Singh was missing his master. The way he was feeling he had to go and see him. That love was growing in him. It is the love and devotion that grows in our heart that determines where the soul is roaming around. When we go up, 
even much later, we can see that we had been there at the time when we were missing our master. The verification comes when we actually go to that stage, even if it's much later. So I'm just giving you this information so that don't be concerned, am I making progress or not? You are, if you're feeling that feeling of love and devotion, your heart for your master, you're making progress. It's as simple as that. When you meditate, meditation is a verification. Great master used to say, meditation is like a thermometer. A thermometer doesn't give you fever. It measures the fever. Meditation doesn't give you spiritual growth. It measures your spiritual growth. Spiritual growth comes from your love and devotion for the master. It measures. When you meditate, you find out where you are. So that is why these are things people haven't fully explained to us. And sometimes we make a mistake thinking we are making no progress because we haven't seen anything. Visual experience is different. The experience of spiritual growth comes through the feeling of love and devotion because eventually above the mind nothing will work except love and devotion. I'll take up a few questions for a little while. We can't even hear you in the front. Why does everyone not get the pull from the master? Is it because of karma? No, it's because you don't respond to the pull. You don't even see it. The great master used to explain, the grace and pull of the master is always there. It's like rain falling. If rain is falling and you put a cup upside down, it never gets filled up. If you turn a little bit around, few drops go in. If you turn it fully around, it gets filled up. What is the cup which is used for getting the master's pull? Your attention. It's the cup of attention. If you put more attention, it gets filled up. If your attention is elsewhere, you're waiting for the cup to fill up, it doesn't fill up. There's no difference in the master's pull. But our cup of attention takes time to turn because of our attachments and desires for things outside. The more we experience, that is why it's a very important thing to go to satsang, to meet the master as frequently as you can so that this cup can keep turning and you can receive the pull, or which is called the grace, grace of the master, it fills up. Not working yet. Okay. <laughs> Can black magic affect a person who has been initiated by a perfect living master? If so, what can you do to rid yourself of these effects? I'll read it for those at the back and for myself. <laughs> Can black magic affect a person who has been initiated by a perfect living master? If so, what can you do to rid yourself of its effects? Black magic cannot affect a person if he's initiated by a perfect living master and uses the words given for repetition as part of the process for attention control, often called mantra or simran, if those words are used. Not only black magic cannot affect you, if there's black magic affecting somebody else near you, it'll run away from there. And I have tested it many times, you can also try it out. But if you get frightened of black magic and forget, then black magic can frighten you. 
still not affect you, but frighten you. So therefore, it's a good thing to make the repetition of the words or the simran a habit of yours, not to be used sometimes. Train the mind to make it a habit so it goes on 24-7. So you wake up in the middle of the night, your mind is repeating those words. Practice can make you do that. No black magic will ever come near you. Where can you achieve true forgiveness from? True forgiveness from your heart. It's a, we have two wills in our conscious system. One is called a mental will, one is called a spiritual will. Spiritual will comes from your intuitive feeling, not from thinking. Mental will comes from your thinking. Mental will does not give you forgiveness. It says revenge. Take revenge. Ask master to punish him. He did so bad. Mental will is hurt because mental will's front face is ego. When somebody insults you, your ego is being insulted, not your soul. Spiritual will comes from the soul and is always forgiving. If you can strengthen your spiritual will, it can overcome the mental will and forgiveness becomes much easy. How do you strengthen your spiritual will? Simple. Mental will tells you what to do every day. Two or three times in a week, when mental will tells you this you must do, especially big temptation, <coughs> say no. Mental will says only one time, no. Never again, no. If you can hold up the no, in a few months you will see the mind will start listening to your spiritual will, the intuitive self, and forgiveness will become easy. And you will forgive everybody. Forgiveness is a very big quality because forgiveness takes care of your karma. When you forgive, you are taking care of your karma, ending it, closing it. So that is why the more you forgive, the better for your own life and karma is taken care of. It's part of the ending of closing of karma. So learn to forgive by strengthening your spiritual will, which can be done by ignoring and saying no. No is said by the same mind. The soul doesn't speak. Only the mind speaks and the soul listens. So say no with the same mind, but with the will of the soul. And say no. When the mind wants too much to do something, that's the time to say no. If you can do it three, four times a week, you'll find your spiritual will growing and the mind will begin to be your servant and follow what you say. What is deja vu? And is there a significance to our names? This time it worked. I know. <laughs> I still read it for myself. What is deja vu? Is there significance to our names? Deja vu is feeling that you have been there before. Deja vu is when you feel you have met this person before. Of course you have been there before and you have met that person before, but not in this body. Therefore it looks deja vu. If it was in this body, you would just be called local memory. Deja vu is old memory, very often from past lives. Is there significance in our names? According to astrologers, they say the names are very significant. They connect with your Rashi. They connect with your ascendant planet on the chart. Can you imagine just to understand this? I have to study all of astrology <laughs> and knew how to draw up the charts. Then I found out charts are drawn differently in India, differently in the West. So I had to learn double. <laughs> but the thing is that Names have been connected with this. There was a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, we were both studying together. His name was also, first name was Ishwar. My name was Ishwar Puri, his name was Ishwar Sharma. We both appeared for the competitive examination. 
And we were walking on the street of Delhi and we saw an astrologer who did his astrology with a parrot. He had many cards in front of him and he would ask the parrot, pick up their Rashi. And if the Rashi matched our name, then we are going to be successful. So I went there and the parrot drew out the letter I. I passed the exam. The other man said, oh, I'm sorry, my, what about my turn? And the parrot picked up I again. He also passed. I said, does he pick up any other letter? <laughs> anyway, that is how they connect the name. I personally don't believe that there is much truth in our fortune depending upon the name that's been picked up. It's an astrological belief. It may be very partly true. But I have seen people whose charts were so good, life was not so good. There was a great astrologer long ago. His name was Brigu. Brigu did a lot of meditation and he was able to find out the truth about the lives of all the people born in the past, born at his time, and will be born in the future. He found people repeats the history of their old experiences, so experience can be recorded in advance for those people who will be born at a certain time, at a certain place, astrologically based on the position of the planets. So he prepared a whole list of papers. And he said, if you are born at that time, in that place, this is what will happen. Then he simplified it. If you happen to come across these pages at any particular time, that page will be pulled out, which is relevant to that time. This was called Bhrigu Santa, And there are people still holding those pages. And I went to one of them. And he picked up the right page. Not my date of birth or time of birth but the time of my arrival there. And the page was very good, written very old, old handwriting on parchment or something. So it did look that it was old. But some people have had that experience, some have not. But Bhrigu got a curse from the gods, according to the story about him, that when he began to tell people's future, which are not supposed to be told in human life, he got a curse that when a person will come and see your paper, what has happened to him, you will be able to read in that paper, what's going to happen, partially true, partially false. Almost all my friends who've gone to Bregu, they say it's amazing how we can produce a paper telling exactly who we are, where we come from. Even the United States people came to India and correct paper was pr produced about their family, United States. But the future was not followed, what this paper said. This is because of the curse. So it's not very useful to know only your past. Sometimes I feel knowing the past is very harmful for us because it brings memories of things we may not have done, which were too good, brings guilt to us. And guilt is a great detriment on the spiritual path because guilt pulls us in the back and therefore guilt relives the karma which we are trying to forget and move forward. Therefore it's not good to look into the past. People even ask me, tell us a little bit about our past life. I can make any story, nobody's going to verify it. <laughs> but I said it will pull your attention to the past. It will make you relive many of the things which have already happened. Why recreate a karma you already paid by remembering it again? Think of the future. Think of what's going to happen in the future. Then leave guilt behind. Leave those things behind which come in the way of our spiritual progress. Our mind gets so occupied with these things that we suffer in meditation. So that is why I'm not now recommending too much, in spite of the fact I learned astrology, I read palm reading, I read all this, and I can tell you hundred stories of my experiences, but I'm not encouraging anybody to be too curious and inquisitive of the past. Some things of the past 
or those which you would not like. Everybody has those things in the past. So why relive that? Live in the future. That will be much better. One more question. Hi, Babaji. My name is Navneet Rehal. I am from I am five years old. Can I get Nam from you? I love you. I love you too. I love you very much. Beautiful. When Nam can be understood, basic understanding, you can get initiated. Great master used to give half initiation, half nam to his young children. You are a small child and you grow up a little more, you can get half nam. And he used to give half nam consisting of how to listen to the sound within. Little children having much less attachment, not having too many desires, very limited desires, were able to hear the sound quickly. It was a good beginning. When they grew up older, became teenagers, they'd go back to great master and he would give them the second part, the repetition of words and listening further to the sound within that comes after concentration of attention. This was a, a common practice with him. So, I have a picture from the time, great master went to a hill station called Kalu Kibad in India. My dad and I were also in that group traveling with him. And he saw a bunch of children. And they said they are seekers because their parents are seekers. Will you give them some blessing? He said, gather them. They are under a tree. They just gathered outside. And uh, the assistants who were accompanying Great Master asked, would you like to do Chanti? Chanti means selection of people who are ready for initiation out of these children. He said, they are all selected. No Chanti. And he sat them and gave them half Nam to all of them. Some were six years old, some seven years old, very small children, all of them. And this was a great scene for us to see. I have met those people when they grew up. One of them came and saw me here with a white beard. Same boy I saw in that village. And he came because his son is working in America. So he was very keen to see me. And when I saw, I saw how beautiful, how, how much they have progressed in the spiritual path. How great was the look of that great master led me to think, are we marked souls? Because that's the theory, that masters come to pick up marked souls. And we are marked for each master. And when our time is right, such a master appears in our life. Is it true that we are marked souls? Or is it true that when a master looks at us and selects, we get marked? I have now begun to believe that maybe a master can mark us when he looks at us. And therefore, it's all his moj. You know what the meaning of moj is? It's Indian word. Actually, Punjabi and Hindi word. In Punjabi, it means have fun. Let's have moj. Mojankari in Punjabi. So it's a very... And when we say it is his moj, how are we translating it? It is his will. There is no connection between will and moj. So I have found a different way to translate this. I say moj is playful will. Because that's what I found. These masters are very playful. They have immense power, which we cannot see, because they live like ordinary human beings. But their moj is great. So when the moj fell on those people, and they got initiated. It was remarkable. So, my dear friend, you will get 
initiated maybe in two stages, half initiation and full initiation, just a little while later. Thank you very much for listening to me. We probably have distribution of prashad. If they can bring it to me, I'd like to give it a great master's blessings. There's no jokes. <laughs> we used to believe that every time you come and give any talks, you also tell some jokes. I thought that as souls coming here and feeling we are trapped itself is a big joke. <laughs> that we take it so seriously. That we can't take it like we have come for a ride. We have come for a ride just for temporary enjoyment of a different kind of experience. Why different? Because this, this experience in the three worlds of matter, senses, and mind has pain and pleasure. It's called the world of duality. And we don't have duality in our true home. Wanted to see something new. Good, we saw something new. We experienced it. We experienced pain and pleasure. We experienced day and night. We experienced all kinds of pairs of opposites which only exist here and don't exist in our true home. It was nice. But what was the purpose of it? The purpose was that consciousness appreciates. How does it appreciate? If you are sad and somebody makes you happy, you appreciate that happiness. If you are not sad, somebody makes you happy, you appreciate a little less. You appreciate a lot more. That's the nature of consciousness. You appreciate a lot more if you have just experienced the opposite of that. We have come and experienced the opposite of our true home. We have experienced duality here, experienced pairs of opposites here. They don't exist in our true home. Now, when we go to true home, what happens? We dance with joy more than anybody else, more than all the other souls. And this has been written down in some scriptures, some books, notably in a book called Anurag Sagar, Ocean of Love, which is a dialogue between Kabir and Dharamdas, his disciple. In that he describes that those souls which have come away from their true home and had this experience of duality, when they go back, they are hunts transformed into Hans. Those who are already there are Bans. The Hans dance and sing much louder than those who are Bans. And the Bans ask the Hans, how come we are all souls? What is making you more happy? And we tell them, you don't know what you are missing. <laughs> you don't even know what you are having here. Because we have seen the opposite of it. One of the big features of coming here and going back. Not a good joke, right? Okay, I'll tell you a local joke then. <laughs> a joke I call Jonathan's joke, because Jonathan told me, if you like it, say good. If you don't like it, say Jonathan is wrong. <laughs> it's about a parrot joke. I mentioned the parrots earlier. There are a lot of parrot jokes. In this parrot joke, there was a pastor of a church and he had two parrots. And he trained them to sing nice verses, nice verses from the Bible, nice holy words, he would, the two parrots. And he gave them beads in their hands so they could move the beads, like almost like prayer. And the parrots would be, move the beads and they would sing nice verses, very holy atmosphere they would create. So one of the parishioners, one of his followers told the pastor, what a wonderful idea to have these parrots repeating such holy words all the time. Your church and your house is all full of holy ambience and holy, holy words. He said, you can also get this. These parrots are little birds. They learn what you teach them. And obviously, I've trained them to repeat these. They hear it. Therefore, they are repeating them. 
you also get two parrots and train them, they will also learn. So the parishioner, he went to the pet market and bought two parrots and brought them home from the cage. When he opened the cage, the two parrots happened to be female parrots. And they both said, we are hookers, you want to have a good time? <laughs> he was shocked, what have I done? What kind of parrots have I brought? So he went to the pastor, he said, I brought the parrot, but they are talking this nonsense. He said, they must have been trained with those words by somebody earlier. You can retrain them. Now you teach them new words. In fact, if you take my parrots, when they will be having beads in their hands and saying prayers and good things, your parrot will also learn that they will also st start saying good things. So he borrowed the two parrots from the pastor and brought them home. And he opened his parrots. And these two parrots of the pastor are sitting. And he opened his two female parrots. And the female parrot said, we are hookers, you want to have a good time? Those two male parrots looked at each other. Then one shouted to the other, throw away your beads, our prayers have been answered. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so don't say I didn't tell you a joke. I'm very happy that I could come and spend time with you and share some of these experiences. I have read some books, but not many. I found that books can confuse you. So I dropped books and said, let me investigate. It's a good tip I can give you, that if you read too many books, they say opposite things. I had this experience of not finding the third eye center. When I went to Great Master, I said, Master, it's so hard. So he told me the experience to how to get the third. He said, it's where I'm sitting, just to find out where I am. And he told me, do not start your meditation till you feel you are at the third eye center. Do not try to repeat the words. Do not try to uh, listen to the sound till you first feel you are there, even if it takes time. I, I, I remembered it, I used it, it worked. I came, I went to America, and first satsangi group I met, I happened to say this. They said, we haven't heard this before. Where did you hear it? I said, I heard it from the master, great master, Baba Savan Singh. We have all the spiritual books, including his books. We never heard of it. I said, do you have any book of Great Master? Yes, we have a book called Spiritual Letters. These are letters written by Great Master himself to his American disciples. He doesn't say what you are saying. You're bringing up some new stuff. I said, can you lend me that book? Because I haven't read it. I will read. So I took that book, Spiritual Gems, and took it home and spent all night going through it. Every time great master wrote to an American disciple, do not begin your meditation, you must first be a third eye center, I marked it. 16 places in that book. Next day I said, have you read the book? Yes, we have read many times. I said, did you read these words? We don't know how we missed these words. Do you know how we read books and accept what we have already accepted? and don't go further. We don't, and every book, same book means something different when you read it again. This is a problem. One man had come to me in America and said, somebody gave me a book that contains spiritual truth. I said, what is the name of the book? Path of the Masters by Julian Johnson. Nonsense, he's just writing from something they learned in India, and they have no value for us here. I threw it away. I said, sorry that this book has meant a lot to other people, but sorry, it didn't mean much to you. Six months later, he came back to me, carrying that book with him. He said, I have found the truth about the need of a living master and what he can give us. I said, where did you find that? 
a book called Path of the Master by Julian Johnson. I hear the book. Hey, but that's the same book you brought last time, you threw away last time. He says, I just found it again. And this time it means so much different. I'm only telling you examples of how we have limited understanding. When we read, we accept that which we are already ready for. When later on you read the same book, you'll find more in it. People hear my talks. I ask ten of them, what did you hear? I hear ten stories. Same talk, ten versions of it. People hear what they're ready for very often, what they've already accepted. It's just like somebody has now re-verbalized what they do. It's something like that, that you read books. Also, books contain contradictions. Even great master's book. In one place, he writes to an American disciple, trying hard and meditation will lead you nowhere. It's all master's grace. You should always beg for master's grace. Another person, he writes, try very hard. You have to try hard even to get master's grace. Contradiction. The contradiction in the books. Which one is right? Which one is wrong? Both were right, but for two different people at two different times in their life. So that is why I said there is nothing like reading your own self. Bulle Shah says, I have read all the books of the world and nothing has been found. Till I found out that the real read, thing to read is your own self inside. Bulle Shah says that. In Guru Granth Sahib it says, in the Sikh scripture it says, Padiye jete arja, padiye jete swas, padiye. Even if we read every, every moment, with every breath, even if you read every month, if you read every year, if you read all your life, he says, it only increases your ego and you get nothing. The truth remains inside you. Reading itself is not going to lead anything. Checking it out. When you check out, what he said was right. But you can't say it before that. Therefore, my suggestion, humble suggestion to you is that please don't just go by intellectual study of the subject. Test it out practically by regular meditation and you will get results if you make it regular and not sporadic, not sometimes. Every morning, every night, give time for meditation and discover what is inside. If you happen to get the sound and the image of your master, proceed with the sound and talk to the master and enjoy his company inside. That will be enough. The rest is formality to take you there. So I hope these few tips I shared with you from my experience, not from books. If they are in the books, very good. If they are not, I don't mind because I have promise to myself, I am not going to say something if I have not practiced myself. I am a hypocrite in that case. In fact, there was a Swami, he was known to be very, very effective in giving advice, especially to children. So one mother, her ch child was eating too much sweets, jaggery, gourd, and he would steal sweets, they were hidden from him. So she took him to the Swami and said, Swamiji, children, li listen to you. Can you tell my child not to eat sweets? Swamiji looked at the child. He said, come after one week. The lady went back to the Swami after one week and said, you asked me to come to talk to the child. He looked at the child, said, child, don't eat sweets. Child stopped eating sweets. Lady went back to Swamiji, if that's all you were to do, why did you make me wait for one week? You could have said the same thing on the first time. He said, you know, at that time I was eating sweets. <laughs> My words would have carried no effect on anybody. If you don't practice yourself, your words don't carry anything. People talk intellectually, give discourses, they have no effect on anybody. But if you speak from your experience, it has effect on people. So that is why I 
say that these are tips given to you. I hope they'll be useful to you. If I, even one of you can get one benefit from it, I'll feel my visit was successful. Otherwise, it's just all talk. Thank you very much for coming. I enjoyed meeting you. There are some people who still want personal time. I'll give some time today. And those who are still missed out can still have time in the next two days when I'm still here before I go for Spain, leave for Spain, and they can contact, if they're not already contacted, Shamshir. Thank you very much and Godspeed and blessings from Great Master.